dark save for light being cast from the big tv screen and the imminent sunrise that's teasing the one starry sky with whispers of morning it's metroid 2 the return of mike <laughs> we'll see if this one gets as many listens as final fantasy tactics <laughs> chrono trigger is still the not just undisputed winner but it's like usain bolt against like middle schoolers like it's just we have episodes that have thousands and thousands of listens and then chrono trigger is like double the second place episode <laughs> i don't know why i mean i could kind of guess but so hey what are what are what are you doing here and what are we here to talk about uh i got all excited that nintendo is releasing a new metroid game that i harassed you into doing an episode about an old metroid game <laughs> <laughs> and and did i understand correctly you said the developer of the new Metroid game are the is the team that did this one. Is that true? Yeah. So it's they, they used to do Konami's 3D Castlevania games, like the Lord of whatever. <laughs> I don't. I didn't really play those because I didn't care. Um, just, uh, but yeah, it's. I think it's Mercury Steam, and I always want to say Stream, but it's Steam. Um, they did the 3DS remake of the game we're talking about today, and I, you know, I put. I, it's one of the few blog posts I've done in the past few years. <laughs> I did a long review of it. Um, it's a great remake. It fixes a lot of. Well, it's a little. We'll get into it. <laughs> <laughs> that was close. We're not. We're not, re, we're not yeah. reviewing the 3DS game. We're actually talking about Metroid Two: Return of Samus, the Game Boy game. Yes, which according to Wikipedia came out in November of 1991, and I'm sure I've said this for almost every Game Boy game we've played, but. Tiny screen, tiny chiptune, tiny graphics. My brain just always thinks late 80s. And then when I see the year that these games actually came out, I'm like, right, because miniaturization is hard. Like, that's yeah. that's what's impressive about it, not the fidelity. Um, and the but, Game Boy is a brick. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> like, without exaggerating, the thing probably weighed, with batteries in it, like, two pounds which is a lot to like hold out in front of you. I even think my switch is heavy sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, what's your experience for this game? Like, cause mine is, is, is the short game boy experience of, I, I played this when I was at Brian's waiting for my turn on the, like the super Nintendo. Or I'm the, the Sega real Genesis. Game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was a time filler. It was a, my dentist office, uh, highlights magazine. So my experience of this game, so I did have a Game Boy growing up and we did enough family trips, um, whether just, you know, to see grandpa in Cleveland and it's a two hour drive or actual family trips, camping or going to other states, that the Game Boy was a significant part of my childhood gaming. And this was one of the games I got, I probably for Christmas in 1991, um, and at the time, it was one of my favorite games on Game Boy. It would join the ranks of the port of Bionic Commando or the, you know, simplified Contra called Operation C, um, Ninja Ga Gaiden, Shadow. I called it Gaiden <laughs> growing up, so it's still stuck in me, even though it's Gaiden. And so it was one of these games that was like, at the time, was like, hell yes, I've got Metroid and I'm on the go. And... uh in like in contrast to like what are your portable gaming options in 1991 <laughs> a lot of people might have had like those little like tiger electronic like you can jump and you can land and you just need to time it right to avoid the pie that comes across the screen like, oh, like the the game and watch style yeah where all the frames of animation are on the screen all the time and it just <laughs> illuminates them yeah oh, and so awesome. like and not to take i mean the concept of the show is can you play this and enjoy it without <laughs> like i do like that context of like how much better is this than a tiger electronics handheld <laughs> piece That's, of crap we'll, um, we'll know we've we've played every game there is when we have to start reviewing game and watch and tiger electronics yeah so my two memories are being in a car, probably with a clunky light attachment, increasing the weight of the Game Boy even more so that I didn't have to rely on streetlights every second to see my game. 
Um, and that, and that I remember the Super Game Boy letting you play this on a TV, that something about the way they coded Metroid let them programmatically target the different sprites better than most other Game Boy games. So the colorized version of it is actually, it's not like NES level, but it's better colorization than most Game Boy games got, where it was like, well, we just picked the four shades differently. (laughs) Yeah, it seems like the Super Game Boy was either better understood by some developers or was something some developers maybe cared about more or something, but like some (laughs) games you plug into the super game boy and you're like, Oh, it's, it's just stretched out. Like it's just bigger now. (laughs) And then other games you're like, Oh my God, this changed everything. Like the original uh, Pokemon that we played pretty recently, like on super game boy is a completely different experience. Uh, We need to do that thing before we jump in uh, where I I shill a little bit. Um, If you want to uh, recommend games, we should play, see what we're going to play. Uh, you want to talk to us, you want to see what we're playing, uh, you can go to our website, you can see the games list there, you can hit us up on Twitter, you can uh, see me play most of these games on Twitch. I played a lot of this one uh, this past week on stream, and uh, my review will be less surprising to those folks. Um, (laughs) If you want to go kind of above and beyond and do something to support the show, uh, ratings and reviews, always helpful. Recommending us directly to people you know is super duper helpful. Uh, And if you're really crazy, you can uh, support us on Patreon and actually give us some money. Uh, And if you are a Patreon supporter, you get the after show, um, which uh, if you and I have time after recording, I would like to do a a short after show with you about the new act razor, because there's actually a fun link between this Metroid game and the new act razor. So yeah, wow. Yeah, that'll be in the after show. Um, But if you support us at a high enough level, you can actually get shouted out on the show. So we want to thank our 8-bit classics and since uh george is uh let's say shooting on location today um i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna pick up the weight for him and thank kevin a harmless egg john a gentle infant yarno an alpha and jason a gamma and then our 16-bit heroes jacob a zeta michael an omega and then our full 3d supporter david the queen of the metroids let's uh let's talk about these game boy visuals yeah, uh, just it's important to remember that the Game Boy was a handheld system because, my God, the ratio of Samus to screen height <laughs> is more dramatic than not every Game Boy game, but a lot of them. Uh, you're like a third of the screen tall, kind you're of, gigantic. almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's like playing uh, Arkham Knight on the Game Boy. <laughs> you're just half the screen. <laughs> and... Uh, I mean, I think that for a Game Boy game, uh, Samus looks good, like very detailed. Um, it, I wasn't really like I was never wondering where I was on the screen. Um, they do the, a pretty uh, good job of keeping you centered. You really only hit the edges when you're like going and like the whole screen is going to shift over. So it's you're never really having to track her down. She's just always smack in the middle. Yeah, I rarely you. Well, I mean, it definitely happened, but it it didn't necessarily feel like I like in some games that scroll poorly, you feel like you're bumping into things before you had a chance to see them. And I didn't feel like that was happening um, that much. Well, in fact, they actually with enemies seem to do the opposite, where once an enemy kind of clips off the edge of the screen, they seem to despawn them. So there were actually a couple like long hallways, you know, where enemies come up from the ground. And I was like, oh, if I just run, they won't chase me because yeah. they stop existing once they're no longer being drawn on the screen. And that there's probably programmatic reasons that they did that. But it's kind of nice with such a small screen to not feel like death is just waiting right off the edge of the screen to pop out and murder me before I could react. Yeah, Metroid 2 has no object permanence. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'd say the visuals are pretty sparse. Like the most of the areas don't even have a background, and the the places that do, I was actually really thankful for because you it might be a giant cavern where you need to space jump in midair, and you wouldn't even know if you jumped up or down or were still falling without some kind of scroll going on. That's true. Some of the big cavernous areas, if it wasn't for that little bit of texturing you would just have black nothingness. (laughs) You would just be spinning, you know, aimlessly, which is Um, not, uh, doesn't really help you direct your character on screen. Yeah. 
Um, but I don't know. Like I'd say the pretty sparse, pretty simple graphics, like uh, less going on than the original NES Metroid. It's like they, they stripped it down a bit. You can tell like, did you feel like, so you, you were actually the person who pointed this out to me. I think probably when we were doing the super Metroid episode is that these games are supposed to be like Samus Aran, super badass against everything, right? You're on an alien planet where everything is hostile to you. There are no friendlies. There's no backup coming, right? You're not just trying to wait for the, the good guys to ride in and save you. Like it is you against the entire planet you're currently on. And the all black background, I think does a really good job of that kind of dark spooky, like you're underground and it's scary. You're in space, but because there's no colors, or at least I didn't, I didn't play this, you know, colorized, um, you end up with texture doing a lot of the heavy lifting on which of the like 10, I think is it 10 areas that you're in and they do a good job. They don't do a great job. Like the textures all look good, but I didn't always, I couldn't always look at it and be like, Oh, I'm definitely in this area or that area because they're, they only have four colors. They have so few pixels. Like there's a yeah. limit to how detailed your textures can be. Um, which sometimes left me feeling like this looks nice, but it's not, communicating a ton of context yeah and i mean in defense of it it does help enemies pop off like the fact that the background is just black um anything that comes onto screen is super noticeable because of that there's there's no so like there are games old games you play and you're like i can't even tell if i can jump i've heard you guys reference that in some <laughs> of the castlevanias like is that part of the background i can't tell <laughs> Yeah, that and, that is, that, oh man, that's an interesting point because I would say they did this partially for technology limitation reasons and partially for atmospheric reasons, like, oh, it's scary and dark. But the fact that you literally only have the foreground and then the textures of like the the meshy stuff and things like those are actually all in the foreground. You can interact with them. so my god does this game have zero literally zero backgrounds is there only four foreground because everything can be interacted with the only backgrounds i'm aware of are seems functionally those large rooms where you might be falling or jumping through them and therefore that scroll gives you some tiny bit of context for where you're going uh, yeah. we'll get to on <laughs> that. and that's that's kind of wild you know i guess that's sort of like some of the old Mega Mans, and and we we're mostly okay with it there, but I never thought I would collide with that and say like, no, this is probably the right artistic choice as well. <laughs> so that's, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. It is sparse and lonely. And I do, I do hear the argument there that that's thematically relevant to Metroid, but I do kind of still feel like this is probably the least visually interesting Metroid game that exists anywhere. It's super basic. Yeah. I mean, they, so I, I had to play this game with a map. My first bit of time playing it, I did not use a map. And I was like, this is not an experience I'm really picking up right now. So I was like, uh, how am I going to get a map and not have that like harsh, the authentic authenticity of my review? It turns out that they actually published the entire game map with an entire key in Nintendo Power. And I had that Nintendo power. So I was like, oh, aha, wow. if I had played this game at the time, I would have had access to this map. So I didn't feel as bad about it. But uh, in the corner, of, it's like a, I don't know, four or five page spread or something. In the corner, there's like a little call out box that talks about Metroid. And they're like, oh, we put, you know, Metroid on the handheld experience. Could a super Metroid be in development? Maybe. And I'm not being sarcastic. <laughs> it literally says maybe like we're coming back for your money. We know you just bought this game, but we're coming back. But I, I think it's. Uh, they probably felt like. Such a quantum leap going from the limitations of the Nintendo to the way more pronounced limitations of the Game Boy and then knowing like where they were going to go after that was like even a leap up from the Nintendo. So 
detail wise, I would say this is as detailed as the the NES game, but the lack of color just means you're you're just doing it all with light and shadows. Yeah. It just makes me, you, as you were talking about Nintendo Power, like Nintendo seemed to really be exploring the business models around omitting information in the game so you'd have to buy their guides or yeah. call. Did you ever call a tip line for a Nintendo game? That's a fair question. I don't know if I ever called a tip line. I definitely had the magazines. I did buy some guides for a few different games. Um, I got a few as gifts where like a relative just knew like, ah, oh, he, he plays the video games and then like a book for a game would like show up, you know, my birthday or whatever. Um, but I had that thought because the legend of Zelda, which has a giant comically oversized map for its time in history came with a map in the game box, right? Like you were not expected to keep all of that in your working memory. And yet this game, which is way more linear than metroid and is way more linear than what they went on to do with super metroid it's just like okay just just memorize it all and when (laughs) like in 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 the pokemon towns if you just had that single pop of color that that would probably be enough right area one is red area two is green area three Mm -hmm. is orange right something like that but doing it all in black and white means you don't really have enough visual information to keep this whole huge world in your head it's it's too much or i well, i felt like it was too much well and like even if you have a map to reference the game is cropped so tight on your character that i feel like you're gonna have to go back and forth constantly to know where you are you, like you need that beacon constantly like okay i climbed up on top of a building okay i'm on this building okay i ran and i fell down between two okay i'm still here like I I remember growing up playing with a map to reference and feeling like <laughs> I had to keep up with where I was on that map or else I would have to, I don't know, run around and jump until I saw something recognizable enough to pinpoint myself. And I, I had that exact experience <laughs> last night. I was just like, oh, crap. I thought I was over here, like on these you know two steps, but I was actually over here on these two steps because when I got to the top of the steps, it didn't look like what I expected. And now I have to like reorient. And that's... <laughs> Maybe that's the vibe they were going for, but it it is sort of frustrating. Yeah. And I mean, the original Metroid didn't have a map. And if, if, if I'm invited back to do that episode, I'll have a lot of complaining to do about the original Metroid. I think it's kind of a garbage game (laughs) these days. It's an important, innovative garbage game. Um, I'll never get over the fact that Kid Icarus and the original Metroid used the same game engine. And the reason that I know that is because the weird way I always thought that Samus runs in the original Metroid is also how Kid Icarus runs. Is that how the Kung Fu guy runs? (laughs) Yeah, kind of that. It's like it's like one more or one less frame of animation than you expect. So they take these kind (laughs) of like weird marching steps. Yeah, Uh, that is actually something I noticed with this is. um when you said Samus is huge, I think it's worth pointing out that she's huge so they can put a ton of detail on her. Like her sprite is far more detailed than it was in the original Metroid. So you have fewer colors, way fewer colors, um, and this tiny little screen. And they actually made her look more like she does on the cover of the, the box than you would expect up to and including when you get the Varia suit, um, she looks different. Her shoulder pads get a little bit bigger. The plates of armor in the middle change a little bit. Uh, the colors go from like the, the white that you start with to the darker shades of gray that they have. Um, is there another suit upgrade in this or is it just the Varia no, suit? just Varia. Yeah, but, but still, like the fact that they not only drew a good run animation and they have the, the space jump spin animation... Um, And then they made her huge so they could put all the detail in. And then they had to do that for a second suit. It's like, man, they they really wanted you to appreciate like kind of her badass space armor. Yeah. Any other visual stuff? Um, What do you think of the Metroid designs? Because I thought the Metroids, which are essentially all the bosses, are super cool. And the regular enemies are shockingly boring one of them is literally two horizontal lines 
<laughs> yeah, the enemy designs, that's a great point that uh, there's a lot of detail on the Metroids too. And I mean, rightfully so, it's the name of the game. Um, but yeah, and we don't have palette swaps in this game. It's just, <laughs> <laughs> here's the enemy. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think like the regular enemies, there's... I'm trying to think of what are the memorable ones and like yeah, exactly. probably like the the like the little like I don't know how you describe it like the it's like almost like a stingray but it doesn't have a tail and it like flies in the air and then floats down. Oh, it it looks like one of those poppy things you played with as a kid. Yeah. Like you you push it down on a surface and then it pops up but it it does like a falling leaf thing. Yeah, like that's a pretty like now it's an iconic Metroid enemy but um, most of them are pretty forgettable. Like they, some of them look like bugs. So like, and it's like, okay, there's a there's a fly, and I killed it. <laughs> yeah, there's no the the enemies mostly function more like environmental hazards, where they move in a strict, repeated pattern. If you don't kill them. They don't really hunt. They don't really have AI. Like, they're just things that move on the screen. And then the Metroids, like, they they come for you, right? Like, they don't just move randomly. If you move, they move to where you are. If you try and go under them, they'll try and drop on you. Like, they they are where all the smarts are (laughs) in terms of, like, actual attack patterns. And because the regular enemies, you can honestly mostly just ignore a lot of them. They're their looks don't make them memorable. And then the mechanics also don't make them very memorable. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as visuals and gameplay, like one of the easiest things to, I mean, you already brought up that there's no map in the game, which is in this day and age, unforgivable for this kind <laughs> of game. <laughs> Even if they want to make that game mechanic, you know, um, as far as like earning the map or unlocking it, like lots of games play with not just handing it all to you, but um like for something so tightly cropped that is so based on exploration and secrets to have no map whatsoever is just unforgivable um <laughs> so okay so you just made me think of something that i so i played this on a bigger screen um which changes the experience in some ways from a game boy so when you played this as a kid you played it on an original game boy or a Super Game Boy? Original Game Boy. Original Game Boy. Okay. When you played it this time, did you play it on Super Game Boy? Was it on a big screen or were you on the handheld? No, I played it on a bigger screen. Okay. So I realized that the on- the one and only giveaway I found for some of the, like, what Donkey calls Metroid moments, where it's like, oh, you just have to know this is the wall that you can pass through, is uh, there is, like, a little, like, blip animation when your buster cannon i don't know what her weapon is called when when your your gun uh projectile hits a a solid surface it does make like a like popping blooping animation as if it hit an enemy but if it's a wall you can pass through it does actually pass through the wall so it's visually significant but i'm i'm trying to imagine i barely noticed that it on a giant <laughs> screen. I don't know if I would have put that together on a, a physical Game Boy screen that's the size of a postage stamp. Yeah, you'd almost you'd hope they would reinforce that with sound design, which we'll get to. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm trying to think anything else visual. I think that's most of my notes. It's pretty sparse. It's not. It's the least visually interesting Metroid that exists. <laughs> <laughs> um, it has its moments like you're like you're saying samus is detailed the metroids are very detailed like it's not like i don't think this is like embarrassing but it is pretty like unremarkable on the whole <laughs> yeah and i would say like for its time they went with a super detail heavy style that probably really set it apart from a lot of other game boy games um that are just like nothingness right because they're trying to put more information on the screen so each individual thing is smaller um but when you and it, it's impossible not to think like the next game they made was super metroid which is amazing looking and right and then the later metroids like the primes which are all 3d and crazy um mm-hmm. but yeah let's uh pretend that those last few sentences didn't happen use your comment about sound design as a segue into audio 
<laughs> All right. Uh, how many songs are there in this game? Three? Uh, Maybe. Man, <laughs> I was weirdly put out by the music in this game. <laughs> I think there might only be three songs, maybe four. I guess that when you're fighting a Metroid, there's a there's a little battle tune. Um, there's there's like the hero music right when you start the game. There's the you're adventuring in, in between places music, and then there's the I'm a scary cave kind of music. <laughs> and I think that's it, other than the Metroid battle music. <laughs> so I think you might be right, and. The thing that irritates me about that is not the lack of variety. It's like the way they applied it. So when you go between certain areas, and I I didn't get to stress test this, so maybe there's an obvious reason, but like when you go between certain areas, it plays that kind of more heroic, like we're exploring, we're going and murdering Metroids, right? And that felt cool the first couple times. And then when I was getting a little lost because I didn't have the map and it would go between complete silence and heroic music, just literally from a single screen transition, (laughs) I was like, ah, that's jarring. And since I'm lost, it doesn't feel like I'm going to do anything heroic. So (laughs) this isn't really setting the mood. I do like that there's big chunks that have either no music at all or that spooky cave music, which is. Dude, did that game music not make you think of Earthbound? The second I heard that, I was like, oh, this is very Earthboundy." <laughs> yeah, I could see that. Right. Um, but here's the thing that, that really irritated me. When you are on a screen that has uh, the cool little visual of the Metroid broken out, like it shed its jellyfish form and it's evolved into who knows what, right? Like uh, when you're on those screens, it... The what would be the music layer is replaced with like the Metroid cry, the sound they make. And I immediately thought of the original Zelda and I was like, oh man, this is like when you're near the boss room in the dungeon in the original Zelda, it lets you know that you're like really close to the boss room. But you know what? After you kill the Metroid, that doesn't go away. So when you go back onto the screen that has the the cool little shell of the the evolved Metroid. It, it's still playing that, which because you have to hunt down 39 Metroids, I was constantly like, did, did I miss one? What? Why? Why? Yeah. What is making that noise? And I was like, this is such a missed opportunity. Like now there should be nothing like it should be silence now to denote that I got them. Which I, that'd be a comment we missed in the visuals is like, while you do have a counter in the HUD at the bottom of the screen for how many Metroids are left, there's basically no other indication whatsoever of where to go whether this hallway you're going down is something you've already completed, like there's yeah. a, there's a whole lack of communication around your progress other than a number. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's really just, they plopped you down on the planet and they were like, all right, we think there's less than 40 of them. Go <laughs> kill them until nothing is moving. You can't <laughs> say until nothing's making a sound because apparently they <laughs> chirp yeah. from beyond the grave. Um, yeah. I, I see. What you, yeah, there's a lack of follow through on that Metroid sound cue that got you excited briefly and then disappointed you. Um, I do. I do think the music is good. It's just there's no not much of it, and so you just get kind of worn down by. You're like, yeah, I know this song. Okay, and um, you know, I don't think any of the music rises to the level of like Crade's music or Brinstar or some of the like the best you know Norfair music like. None of it gets to that height, but it's good music. Um, It's just they only wrote three songs. (laughs) I've long speculated that Game Boy games, well-designed Game Boy games are designed to be played silently, right? Like there's, you're in the, you're in the back of the minivan. You're going to see your grandfather. This is the, the third time this summer you've made this drive and your parents are just like, Mike, for the love of God, turn that thing off. <laughs> and instead of actually turning it off, you just turn the volume all the way down. And so you still need to be able to play the game with zero sound. And there may be Game Boy games that it's like, no, it's impossible to play this without the contextual sound information. But I've, I haven't come across one that I, I've noticed yet. But I don't think that that's an excuse to like not to not right like it's like you have this game that's probably going to take somebody 
you know, five to 15 hours on their first playthrough, you know, maybe throw like a fourth and fifth piece of music in there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if you got, if you managed to beat the game on this playthrough, but the ending music is fantastic. Maybe oh. the best music in the game. Um, so Man. YouTube that <laughs> if you didn't get to hear it. Um, how about sound effects? I think the sound effects do better than the music as far as a, a review. Um, the, the missile, the ch- chunk, the, like the kind of the, the, the feeling when like a, the enemies almost like pop like balloons almost when you kill them. And I, I found that very satisfying. I'm just sh- like, um, just feels good. The, the, um, what else, what else did I hear in this game? Uh, the, you know, very the pew, sharp pew noise uh, is not annoying, which I always appreciate in a game where you're shooting constantly. Yeah. Um, when you get hit, it's a very, I, I want to say like a spiky sound. Like it, it's, it's, it's super noticeable when you get hit. You, uh, it's maybe louder than any other sound that happens. Um, and it directly ties with the white flash, right? So you have, because you, you have like no invincibility frames. So the white flash only lasts for a second and the sound is super sharp and super quick because sometimes you sadly hear that sound many times back to back <laughs> because you keep getting hit over and over. Yeah. Um I, I found the sound design pretty solid in this game for a Game Boy game. Okay, so I agree with all of that, but my addendum is this may have one of the worst low health warnings <laughs> of any game from this era that I've played because it's not just that the noise is terrible because the noise itself is actually not that bad. What blew my mind about it is one it is way too loud it's way too loud and i get it it's because it had to come out of a little game boy speaker but uh, like it's just way way too loud and then the thing that really confused me and maybe this is because i was playing it on you know like blown up hardware but i swear when i was gaining health because it's i think it starts at 45 hit points remaining so if you have 10 hit points, you may pick up a fair amount of health before you get back over that low health, uh, you know, barrier. And I swear to God, there were times where I would pick up health and the low health warning would get louder. And then I would pick up health and then it would get quieter again. And it was like every other time it seemed like it was alternating between this like high volume and low volume. And I, I can't, believe that that's actually what happens but there's something in the way the sound is being played at that moment that was tricking my brain into being like oh god the alarm started going off no wait it's been going off it's just still going off <laughs> hated it hated it so much and i was having a hard time when i first started playing it so i was hearing that noise a lot so do you think it's worse than one of the early zelda games heart beeping because those are pretty bad too. <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's a contender because it is lower pitched. Uh, it's not the screeching smoke detector sound that like the original <laughs> Zelda has, but it was it's balanced way too loud. And the only thing I could possibly think of is coming out of a tiny Game Boy speaker, so they had to they had to put it up at you know zero decibels so that they made sure it got all the way to your kid ears. But God, on like modern speakers it's just i was like i I just kept turning the volume down i was just like no no it can't be quiet (laughs) enough this is awful (laughs) yeah i can feel that and even if you want to try to defend it by saying well you're low on health you should be (laughs) made aware of that but i don't know most games that have a a, any kind of fire alarm for that should be punished (laughs) yeah i i feel like they actually haven't made a ton of progress on this front. Like a lot of modern games turned off the fire alarm, but they don't always do an amazing job of communicating that information. Cause it's like, no, I still need to know this. Just please do it with some other tool besides a fire yeah. alarm. So it seems like the heavy blood color grade of the screen is kind of the modern version of that, which at least it's not screeching in your ears anymore. But. Yeah, the, the more realistic the game is, the more likely they are. Um, I love the uncharted, like fade to gray, like the you're losing consciousness. Um, th- this game 
any of these games could probably just do like a flashing health bar, right? So your your health bar, your health meter, the health number or something like blinks or flashes. Or even or, your character flashing or something. Yeah, like. some something. But oh man, yeah, it's... I'd, I'd have to do a, a blind taste test with the like original NES Zelda, um, the Game Boy one. Uh, what is it? Um, we played Link's it. Awakening. Yeah, Link's Awakening also had some screechy "Oh my God" noises. So yeah, it'd be interesting to do like a Pepsi challenge <laughs> with low health <laughs> noises from this era and see what you came <laughs> up with. You got anything else for audio besides rubbing in my face that I didn't get to hear the cool end game song? <laughs> no that's it all right uh it's a two button game so the controls and mechanics is mostly about the mechanics um the thing that shocked me with this and i know this is like a dumb thing to be put out by but uh there's not e- not only is there no map there's not even like a pause screen like when you pause the game um samus flashes to let you know the game is paused that's it you don't get yeah. you don't even get the word pause on screen. Yeah, there's there's no time taken to be like here's your current gear or like uh here's your progress like they could have been a progress screen or some kind of indication of where to go like they just nah. <laughs> it's just game and we pause the emulation. <laughs> the the here's your current gear literally caused me that exact moment of consternation where I picked something up like from the was it the the Charizard statue, the, the chorizos, Chozo. chozos. <laughs> chorizos. <laughs> I picked, I picked up a power up from, uh, one of the, um, Cheetos and I sneezed. And so I looked away from the screen. And then when I looked back, I was like, what, what did I get? <laughs> like, I don't, <laughs> I don't look any different. And so then like I started shooting and I was like, my weapon doesn't look any different. And so then I was jumping around and I was like, I can't, no, nothing has changed what has changed yeah. <laughs> it turned out i got the spring ball so ah. when you go into the morph ball after you get the spring ball your morph ball does actually look different but it doesn't say spring ball on the screen except for like the five seconds right when you pick up the power up and then there is nowhere to reference that information so it's just like huh, huh, what do i do <laughs> what's different and now? A classic Metroid thing is making you use the thing you got to continue. But if you already have Spider Ball, you might not discover you have Spring Ball to get out of where you are. Yes. Because you can go up the wall instead. <laughs> In fact, I noticed they do a an okay job. I would say like a, a pretty decent job of that exact thing. You can't leave here or you can't go very far without using this new power we've just given you the thing that kind of sucks is then that's sort of it like yeah it's not like in symphony of the night or hollow night where you're like oh my god i got the double jump the map has just tripled in size i can go to all these places now right like it's nothing like that it's like oh i will use this to solve one or two problems and then i kind of won't have to do it again if that some of the things you don't need at all in this game (laughs) in any way and that's a little mechanic-y i do have a few controls things um unlike many metroid games you can't switch to morph ball in midair yes that pissed me (laughs) off so much i kept staring at the ground and pointing my gun down (laughs) trying to do it um so that was a yeah potentially frustrating especially if you're trying to get into a gap in the wall you have to already be in morph ball um to like do the Tetris move into the side. Um, the morph ball bounces when it lands, which is, I think different than most. Uh, well, that happens in the 3d ones, but like, I think in super Metroid, you have a very small bounce just to make the animation. So look. it's like a, an event in this game. Yes. Like y- you, you fall and you want to immediately go into like a gap and you're bouncing. Sorry. You got to wait till you land again before you can actually move forward. Yeah. It's, it's like over dramatized because of the small resolution and it, it, it does affect how you move. Yeah. So I found that interesting, but definitely not being able to switch from midair into morph ball was it's super painful going back. I'm so um, glad to hear you say that because <laughs> I felt like such a tool when I would be falling, 
like, I, you know, I was trying to platform and I would be falling and I was like, oh, I'll just go into the morph ball and then use the spider ball. And now I'm just like pointing my arm cannon at the ground <laughs> over and over <laughs> trying to double tap into morph ball. Yeah. Um, in a lot of cases, if you get hit in midair, you can now jump from where you are. Um, yeah. That's a weird mechanic that, where in a game that, that, that often be an limits you. Thing. Not necessarily like this is good and we should include this. <laughs> yeah, for some reason you can jump after you get hit. And I don't know, like I didn't find it to be of much advantage in most cases, but maybe some of those super high maybe they just thought, you know, some of these caverns you're gonna get hit while you're trying to ascend a lot of height. And if you just fall and lose five minutes of climbing because of that, maybe we just let you here's a jump yeah um, that i don't know that's if that's like a course a correction wheels thing <laughs> yeah um you know get your bingo card out to mention cycle time that your cycle time of trying to climb something i don't know um, especially right after you get the space jump they do make you use that in a like a narrow vertical shaft pretty spikes pretty yeah. soon after yeah there's there's like a safe narrow vertical shaft and then very soon after that is one with spikes and and they don't like like we said we don't really do that for every power up in this game but for a space jump they're like nah you're gonna learn how to use this man it's like oh geez yeah. okay well can i learn it in a safe environment no climb this gigantic vertical shaft <laughs> um i feel like samus is kind of rigid in this game like it, she's not nearly as nimble as she gets in later games like she's kind of slow um your your main upgrades increase the height of what you can do, but there's you never get a dash of any kind. It's never never feels like you can really zoom through these environments. It's kind of it's kind of a slow jog slash power walk you're doing everywhere. <laughs> do you feel like Smash Brothers messed that up for you at all? Like <laughs> this probably sounds insane, but when I picture the character Samus Aran like being badass. It's hard not to think of like promotional vignettes from Smash Brothers games where she is very nimble, right? She uses her gun, but she's also punching and kicking and jumping and flipping, right? A lot of like backflips yeah. and corkscrew jumps and stuff. And it, it makes her seem not only very physically capable herself, but like the armor is obviously also powered and supercharged and like helping her be even more spectacular. And then you play the original Metroid and Metroid two. And you do that plotting like walk. <laughs> yeah. and you're just like, eh. and even yeah. by super Metroid, like you are a lot more nimble, but it's still just the earliest bits. At least there's a dash button. So you can, get, <laughs> you can, dash. you can get that feeling like you're flying through the rooms in super Metroid and you don't get that here. You get the, I gotta, uh, gotta stop. Gotta jump. Okay. I landed. Now I can start slowly jogging again okay i gotta jump i'm really slow jump okay i landed like yeah and and slow jump is something that drove me nuts because and i I considered mentioning this in visuals because it is i noticed it because of how jarring the visual is but when you jump you have like a minimum height you have like a a second minimum height and then you basically have like the full jump So if you tap the button for an instant, if you tap it for an instant and a half, or if you press and hold it, you you can kind of, and the reason I realized that is because some enemies, most of the enemies very much do not fly at gun height. So you have to do this like little (laughs) awkward hop. Yeah. But what drove me crazy about it is the, the inertia is makes no sense. Like you come to an instant halt when you, when you do the short jump, you don't like jump, hang, and then fall like you do when you do a full jump. You go like, uh, uh, and it's like you're smashing your head in the ceiling. And then when you get the space jump, that's the spinny one, right? When you yeah. Get, yeah, when you get the space jump, you actually move slower while space jumping. So if you're walking at full speed and you jump forward, it actually slows you down. You instantly yeah. slow down, which is not how jumping forward would work. <laughs> like it's just it's it's visually a little jarring and it it does make you feel way less nimble. And how'd you feel about space jump in this game? <laughs> I, from a control perspective. <laughs> from a controls perspective, I honestly didn't have that much harder of a time with it than I remember having in Super Metroid, but that's because I'm also not great at it in Super Metroid. Like, 
th- this is basically the same mechanic as the cape from Mario, where you have to, like in Mario, if you're flying to the right, uh, you have to rhythmically press, you know, back mm-hmm. so that you you like fluff wind into the 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 cape. Um, and this is basically that with the jump button where you have to, you can't press it too early. You can't press it too late. Like you have to do it at kind of the right yeah. point of the arc. And for some reason I have a way harder time with space jump than I ever had flying as Mario, even though it is literally <laughs> the exact same mechanic with damn near the same timing. Well, and not only do you have to time it right, if you are way too late, she will come out of her spin and you cannot go back into a spin yep. until you do a new jump. Yeah. And so I found that to be kind of pointlessly punishing, um, especially if you go falling through those big cavernous rooms and you're just like, damn it, 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 thud. <laughs> yes. And then you got to start over. <laughs> yes. Um. We didn't say anything about bombs. I think bomb jumping might be the mo- easiest and most forgiving of any Metroid as far as like the area of effect of the bombs is super generous and the ability to climb to something with bomb jumping is way easier. But also, if we get into a little mechanics, there's no reason to do it very often. So it's kind of like, yay, this is easier, but I'm never rewarded for it. So, so I had... There was one point early, fairly early on when I was like, oh, wow, they really made bomb jumping like a legitimate way to get around. But then you get the spider ball really soon <laughs> after that. So it's like, oh, I, I will now never, ever do that again. Um, so maybe it would have been something I used more if like they didn't immediately cut out their own, t- you know, take out their own knees. But I think this is so so much easier in this game that like they intended for it to be used and then they they accidentally completely overrode it right (laughs) like because bomb jumping in super metroid always felt like i am so clever for being able to do this and in this game it just feels like a way you can make the character ascend yeah especially the original metroid but in super metroid 2 there's like hey that energy tank i need high jump for nope i'm bomb jumping to it (laughs) um and this game i don't know it's going to be a theme when we get to mechanics so i don't want to spoil it yet um i feel like with controls i kind of latched on to the things that are different from other metroid games and i think what that tells me is overall the controls are pretty decent like i wasn't constantly frustrated by it um i get what you're saying about enemies placed at like in a game design sense they're at just the wrong height that they're forcing you to do these very specific tiny jumps to hit them (laughs) that's annoying from a design perspective but i don't think i ever struggled with the controls as they are i think samus is pretty tightly controlled um and, and considering the number of abilities she has i didn't really get confused around like using the different abilities um well and like you get weapon upgrades but you only have your gun and missiles which you switch with select right so Mm -hmm. you never get to the point even in the end game where you're like hammering select to try and do the fast carousel through 20 different weapons (laughs) so at first i was like oh select to change weapons that sucks but it's because i was thinking eventually i will have six weapons but you don't you always just have the two i believe you said there was a theme coming with mechanics <laughs> yeah we hinted at it with like talking about how great bomb jumping is and then immediately never needing bomb jumping again um i think there's like a whole design phase to this game that they had to skip past because they wanted to ship in 91 <laughs> where they came up with all these cool power-ups and some of them are staples of the series now like spacer and plasma and uh spring ball and space jump these are still parts of metroid um key elements of samus's design in these games and they uh, most of these were introduced in this game and the the missing ingredient is they didn't hook it they didn't hook it all up like it's like okay we've got this big map We've got these cool power-ups that expand your ability and we're not going to finish that thought now. (laughs) And so that's how I feel about the game is they they have these interesting... It's a dish that has some interesting flavors, but they didn't really blend it 
yet. And uh, so, for, like you mentioned, bomb jumping, and then you get spider ball. You get high jump, and within minutes, you can get space jump. So, yay, I doubled the height I can jump. Just kidding, I have infinite jump. <laughs> and, like, there's no game design around rewarding, like, now you can clear this obstacle, but not this one. Like, that's pretty, like, that is Metroidvania, is look at all these goodies you can't reach. Look at this thing that's in your way come back later when you can absolutely conquer this. And this game is like, actually just kill the right number of Metroids and we'll move the lava for you. (laughs) Um, Instead of that ability feeling of like, yay, now I can go get this thing. And so that's like, that to me is the biggest flaw in this game is like the controls are fine. It's annoying that there's not a map, but really they didn't, they didn't get my brain's reward centers firing by saying, here's this thing you couldn't do. Now you can do it. It's more like, here's a bunch of interesting stuff. I guess play with it. <laughs> yeah, it it is. W- like when you approach a problem and it's like, well, you could bomb jump over this or you could spring ball or spider climb or you can just jump over it using your normal jump because we've now made your normal jump like 3x. Like that's like, so I'm, I'm just always going to normal jump because I can attack while I'm normal jumping. Like, why would I ever take those extra steps? Like give me, you know, narrow, like there's the one part with like the pipes that you have to like spider climb up and fall down. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool because it feels like this is a whole environment that I would not be able to explore if I didn't have these upgrades, but they basically dip into those things like right when you get the power up, then maybe one more time. And then because so many of them are basically get to this harder to reach area power ups, they, you end up being able to solve a lot of problems with like the one of your choice. So of course you use the easiest one. Like you're, yeah. you're never going to do the one that's like super tricky mechanically or that, you know, where you got to press a bunch of crazy buttons in just the right order. Like that's not something I necessarily want to be forced into doing, but then it's, you just, end up asking yourself like why do i have this power like it was literally to get out of the room where i got the power yeah if that um and there's not really an escalation in i mean the metroids get harder but they don't get harder in an interesting way um there's there's four (laughs) different mutations before you get to the queen and the the really the only difference is how many missiles you gotta hit them with and yeah, they're bigger or they shoot little like electric bolts, but game game mechanics wise, it's basically a bigger sponge every time. And so I felt like there was there's just sort of a game design phase where they didn't they didn't finish the meal. They didn't finish like designing the meal. They they have everything here and there's a lot to do, but it just never gets special. It's just kind of like, all right, go kill the next one. Um, so I got about halfway I, I think when i stopped last night i was at 19 remaining metroids so it you know i got halfway ish through um and i because i had a map uh, i happen to know that the last area that i finished um is actually the largest area in the game so if i had put in a similar amount of additional time or less i probably would have been able to to finish um what i realized with the metroids that i've been fighting is uh, so some of those like texture things that help you identify like which area you're in, they look kind of like webbing or netting or, you know, like alien plants or whatever. Um, some of them look kind of like sand, I guess, or I don't know, foam, something. But a lot of the differences between this Metroid fight and that Metroid fight is literally just the, the room you're in when you fight them. Are there narrow platforms or is there a whole floor? Is there... Like, is the environment absorbing some of my shots or can I just get directly to the Metroid? And I I realized like, oh, with so little variety in the things you're hunting, what's changing is one, the number of missiles, right? So part of the fight is just managing your, your material. And then part of the fight is fighting with the environment because Every Alpha Metroid is exactly the same. Every Gamma and Zeta Metroid are exactly the same as the other Gamma and Zeta Metroids, but the rooms you fight them in change. And I thought, that's 
kind of a neat idea, but just like the power ups, they don't really go crazy with it. It's just like the platforms in this room are a little bit narrower than the other one that you killed. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, but I'm just going to stand still and shoot it five times. So that's not really, that doesn't really introduce much in the way of novelness, <laughs> like novelty to the yeah. actual way the fight's going to go. And there's no sense of anticipation. I, I mean, I do, I do love the shell, the Metroid shell like that. I guess there's, there's not no anticipation. <laughs> um, you know, that's a little environmental detail. It's cool. It's like, oh man, some, one of them hatched around here. Where is it? But other than that, there's no, like something other Metroid games start to do really well is like, whether it's something in the background, like a tentacle that's moving and you're like, oh man, I'm about to get to something crazy. Like there's, there's very little of that kind of environmental storytelling um it's really like honestly sometimes you're just running down a hallway it's like five other hallways and it's like oh a metroid okay here we go (laughs) yeah yeah the number of times where i was just like oh huh blam 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 (laughs) blam like that was unsatisfying which i think changes the tone right like it's not i'm i'm trapped on this planet with these terrifying monsters that and it, it says in the manual, like one Metroid could destroy an entire civilization. Like that's how threatening <laughs> they're supposed to be. And only Samus Aran is badass enough to go hunt a planet full of Metroids to extinction, right? Like that is what you're supposed to be feeling is that you are the lone bounty hunter capable of executing this mission. And sometimes it totally feels that way, but more often it just feels like you are the Orkin man like stomping cockroaches that are just like, I don't even care about this. This isn't my house. Like (laughs) I was just paid to come here and kill these cockroaches, which I don't think is the vibe you want when you're playing a Metro game. Like you want to feel like I, you are trapped on this planet with me. I could leave by spaceship, (laughs) but you're all stuck here and I'm going to, you know, use my, my spacer beam to melt your little Metroid faces off. And I just, I didn't get enough of those moments. Mm -hmm. And there's really, I mean, you could call the Metroids boss fights, but they're really more like slightly harder enemies. (laughs) And so like, if you, if you view them that way, then there's really no boss fights in this game other than the queen. Um, and so the game's like a long level with a single boss fight. Um, there's a spring ball has a guardian, but it's really more like an interesting enemy for one minute. Uh, <laughs> these are, by the way, every single thing we're talking about is something I believe they fixed in the 3DS remake. So if you're hearing this and you're like, oh, I guess I'll skip that one. I'm like, go play the remake. It's good. Um, not to give away anything. Um, <laughs> But yeah, the the core aesthetic of Metroidvania is gating you with abilities, making you want something, and then rewarding you for that, or rewarding you for, you know, it's basically, can you make backtracking a reward instead of a punishment? In this game, it's all punishment. It's There's just, there, there are secrets, but you rarely feel like the game is like, yes, you use the thing. You are a good student of this game. <laughs> and it's more like, yeah, okay, here's a missile recharge, I guess. Since you decided to spider ball for four minutes up to the <laughs> ceiling of this cavern, I guess you can refill your missiles. <laughs> so that, okay, that that's my one last major note is, I think how hard it is to replenish health and missiles which are you can only kill the metroids as far as i know with missiles right so yeah there's no charge beam (laughs) yeah so you must either keep your stock high or know where the replenishes are and i had the map i know that there are not a lot of them so that leaves you in a position of kind of constantly like i gotta i gotta make sure i maintain my inventory because a metroid could be around any corner right and you that's that feels like what they're going for but what i ended up doing was saying okay there's like four you know gammas over here and they all take 10 missiles and then i would look and see i only have like 42 missiles where is the nearest like missile replenishing icon it's like way the hell on the other side of the map and i was like okay so the honey i'm going into town (laughs) yes right the the challenge is now getting all the way there and getting all the way back without dying it's not 
once I have the missiles, the enemies will not be difficult. I just need to have enough missiles to shove up their Metroid butts and explode mm-hmm. them. And that, I, the, the, literally the way I phrase this in my notes is, without a map, this game felt frustrating, and with one, it felt like a chore. <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's just like, oh, I just have to walk over here and do this. It's not that walking over there and doing this will be hard or interesting or complicated or difficult. It'll just, I just have to do it. Yeah, the the reward, the they just didn't finish hooking up the reward process in this game. And so it's got you can you can I've said this like four times now. You see all <laughs> the you see all the interesting ingredients that they're working with and it's just not put together yet. So, uh at the risk of, you know, beating this poor Metroid uh with a stick, um I think it will come as an absolute shock to no one who's been paying any attention. Uh, that I give this game nostalgia goggles, just full nostalgia goggles required. Um, but uh, you pointed out something very important, and I have a similar thought, which is why would you play this game in a universe where the Nintendo Switch exists and has Super Metroid? Like, if you want to play Metroid on the go, you could just play Super Metroid on the Nintendo Switch, and then, duh, they remade this game for the 3DS, as you said. So, like, mm-hmm. why would you play this game when you could play? And not every remake is better. Some remakes are worse or they're not worth it, right? They're just okay. Um, yeah, this remake is better. <laughs> it, is, it is. But it, if you want to play a Metroid game on the go, you have vastly superior options, right? Like, this this need or want in your life could be replaced wholesale with a puzzle piece that will fit exactly, but is made of better materials. <laughs> yeah, there's every other Metroid game other than Other M. <laughs> <laughs> and then this one, and then Other M, is what I would tell people. I, this is the game you play if you're a super fan completionist of Metroid in particular. Um, it's it's funny to say, because I don't think it's that bad of a game from its era. Like, it's probably one of the better 1991 games. Um, I, I, you know, I maintain that this is a better sequel than Simon's Quest or maybe even <laughs> Zelda 2. It's a better sequel game. It has fewer frustrations than those sequel games. But that might be because it's blander. Like Simon's Quest and Zelda 2 are trying wild stuff that fails. And there's, there's inter- it fails in interesting ways where you're like, hey, we still might learn from this experiment. And this game, I really feel like this game took the original Metroid, which has its own entire set of problems I would want to complain about. And it dumbs it down and cleans it up and makes it simple. But unfortunately, it kind of ends up boring and chore-like. So that's that's where I land is like you fixed Metroid and it's kind of boring. Yeah. Yeah, I I would say the only real improvement here that was like an experiment that led up to greater things in the future games is a lot of power ups, right? A lot a lot of yeah. power ups that give you little bits of additional power like that's that's the the light through the keyhole of like oh, this is where we must be going. But you know, in, in, in the, the very literal phrasing of like, does it hold up? It's like, n- no, because it's impossible for you to play this now without that knowledge of hindsight. And that detracts from the experience. Like you, you can't, you can't play it without being like, where's the game? Where's the rest of the <laughs> yeah. game? Where's the payoff? The curtain falls, the music plays. The credits roll, then it all fades to black. And you're left by yourself. The fanfare is gone. There's no player two there by your side to share victories won. But as you slowly progress down the hall to your bed, a few great events leak back into your head from the time that you spent traversing the land battling evil fighting the darkness just sword in hand your memories creep in with the edge of a smile you realize again what you've lost for a while 